All right, so we have a quorum. We'll call the meeting to order at 7.07. Um, where is Brian? Are you going to start the recording? Yes, thank you. OK, so we're being recorded. Um, we've been called to order. Does anyone have any additions or corrections to the agenda? Seeing none and hearing none. All right. Members of the public, if you're here to talk about the budget or ask questions after the presentation, um, that's what this meeting is for. If there's something else you wanted to bring to our attention this evening, um, let me know and we'll, we'll hear you now. I don't see any hands. OK. Um, First of all, the voluntary early exit extension. Bill, you want to talk about that, or is that a Bob thing? No, I can do it. Um, okay. Basically, uh, the, this board approved back in December, uh, offering five um, opportunities for an early exit re uh, program for members of uh, West River. We had three people take advantage of it right before um, the COVID crisis. Um, the COVID crisis has now created an opportunity for reflection and um, uh, people to kind of think about their futures and um, their plans. And I would simply ask the board um, if I could extend um, that offering just for the two slots that were not taken. Um, if I got the board's permission, I would publicize it tomorrow and I would just have a, a, a date uh, like next Friday. And it's first come, first serve. Um, I would send out an all staff email that would say the same thing as said before, and it would allow the first two people that uh, turned in um, an acceptable application for them to be able to receive that. I just think that things have changed over the past 10 weeks, and uh, there's been a lot of um, thought processing, and um, I just think it would be a, a good opportunity for uh, the board to support some people if they are ready to move on, and more than likely probably to save some money um, along the way. Okay, so you're not changing the parameters of the of the offering at all. Same deal as before, just extending the length of time to let the other two slots that we had originally offered possibly be taken. Yeah, I'd open it up tomorrow, all comers, first two, and uh, I'd leave it open until next Friday. Okay. So we would just need a motion to do that then. And I see Keegan's got her hand up. And Dana's got his hand up. I just had a quick question. Are you sure you only want to limit it to those two spaces? This decision was made before I, I was a part of your the communal experience here. Is two spaces going to be enough or would that be limiting of folks that would like to take advantage of this? I'm comfortable starting there. And if I get an overwhelming response, as Joe pointed out, you guys meet every Monday, I'd be more than happy to come back to you next Monday and um, tell you that the context has changed. But I think for um, the information that I've been hearing from principals and myself, um, I think the two is, is the appropriate manner uh, to match what the board has already approved at this time. Well, on that note, I would like to make a motion to allow Mr. Anton the opportunity to reopen those two opportunities for the early exit. I'll second it, Joe. Dana. Thanks, Dana. D did you have something else you wanted to say, or was that it? That was it. All right. It's been moved and seconded to allow to extend the uh, early exit, voluntary early exit. Um, is there any discussion on the motion? I'm looking for hands. I don't see any. If I've missed you, please speak up. Um, otherwise, you ready to vote? All right, we have to do the roll call. All in favor of extending the voluntary early exit, um, please say aye. Dana. Aye. Mike. Aye. Al. Aye. Keegan. Aye. Howie. Aye. All right. The ayes have it. The motion passes. Thank you very Damn. much. You're welcome. Okay. 
The next item, the next item is the budget presentation. For that, we're just going to let Lori go through her presentation. Um, I would say if you have a clarifying question during the whole thing, raise your hand and I'll try and get you, I'll try and get that question, we can try and get that question answered. But probably just because of this format, the easiest thing is to wait until the end. Um, we can zoom back and forth. Um, and, uh, and, you know, show you and go back to slides if there was a slide that's important. Can everybody see the slides, the screen now with the West River budget review and tax talk? Yes, Joe. Perfect. Okay, take it away, Lori. All right, so I saw some new um, names uh, in the Zoom meeting that I haven't seen before. So that's terrific because I've, I've been through this um, presentation once back in March, uh, just before the first vote was to happen. Um, so it's great to have, uh, you know, additional people here to, to hear uh, how the budget process went and then how is the unified tax rate established and then how does it flow through to the individual towns? So without further ado, uh, we will flip to the first um, or the second uh, slide. And as we get started, uh, you know, I think it's important to remind ourselves who West River Modified Union Education District is. And it starts with their mission statement, which was developed around the time of the merger. So in West River Modified Education District, all students will have an outstanding educational experience in a safe and welcoming environment so that they may achieve and surpass their learning goals. The West River Modified Education District is responsible to the needs of its community and provides the necessary systems, staffing, and resources needed to ensure that all of our students will become informed, empowered, and engaged global citizens. So before we dive into the budget process, um, you know, because there's new people on the call, let's just talk about what is the structure of West River. So the structure of West River is uh, it operating three elementary schools, uh, which operate pre-K, K through five, grade five, and one middle high school, grade six through 12. So that all students, uh, around 546 students, uh, is the amount of students that West River is responsible for. So where are those students? And uh, next slide, Joe, there we go. Um, so now some of these numbers have changed since the first presentation. So these are approximate numbers of students in the buildings. Um, Newbrook has an approximate 98 students and, and they typically run straight grades, K one, two, three, four, five, a teacher for each grade. And then Jamaica uh, currently has approximately 35 students and their grades are combined. Uh, they have a pre-K, K first and second and a third, fourth and fifth. So two classrooms up there. Leland and Gray Middle High School now hosts the sixth graders um, and has approximately 296 students in the building. Um, this number also includes uh, some tuition students that are coming in from a variety of sen sending towns, such as Wardsboro, Athens, Grafton, um, Dover, Marlboro. Uh, Townsend has 117 students um, and they typically also run straight grades. So it gives you a little overview of the, the schools that are operating within West River. And the next one is the board values. So um, the board values, they, uh, the board developed these values, uh, which are key to the budget process. And the, but these values can be found on the board website um, or in this presentation. Um, and Joe, do you want to just talk a little bit about how they, how and when they were developed? Sure. I just had to find a way to, I had to unmute myself. Um, these, we, the West River Education District started developing these prior to becoming operational. Um, we spent um, an entire day um, sort of going through and comparing what each component that was coming into the West River District was bringing 
and started talking about what we valued about each particular school building, each particular grade level. Um, and this is, these have been an evolving, um, these have been evolving values. You know, the first, we made a first set, we had a summer retreat again. Um, we, we looked at these, we revised them, and, and these, this is the second revision of these goals. And we may very well late summer when we can hopefully have another retreat and continue to discuss these values. They get looked at um, by the entire board in a, in a retreat process um, on an annual basis so that we can continue to focus the board on what's important. And then when we're making decisions about what we're going to do from a budget standpoint, we can go back to these. They hang on the wall behind us at each meeting. Um, and, and we can really go back to and point to, and we will also ask, um, you know, uh, when, when requests are made of us, we'll also say like, how does that, we'll also ask, how does that support our, our values? Um, so they're really, they're really the central, um, you know, they give us something to go back and look at that's concrete that we've all agreed is important when we make these decisions. Great. Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. Um, so continuing on with the next slide, uh, just to talk about the, the actual budget development process. Um, the budget process actually starts at the SU and many people aren't necessarily aware of that, um, especially when they're thinking their own district. But it starts with the special education service plan uh, that is due to the AOE by law um, on October 15th. So that's when we put together all of the special education needs. Um, and then that budget informs all of the district's budgets. Along with that special education budget, the superintendent's office bud budget is also developed. And then typically we do a pre preliminary agency fund budget um, that is uh, just for the boards to look at that that actually ha you know, has the most flux throughout the whole budgeting process. Um, so all of these budgets that start at the SU feed into this West River budget, as well as River Valleys, Wyndham, uh, Stratton, and Marlboro's. So this season, um, this budget season, we uh, the board formed a budget committee and they took a deeper dive into looking at some of the different um, uh, requests of the leadership and they also you know they also refer back to their values as Joe was saying and then these guiding principles that um, really got us to a first draft okay so let's uh, dive into the West River budget for fiscal year 21 and you can see there were three drafts presented and I wanna walk through those three drafts so you can understand uh, the deliberations that were involved. So on the left of your screen, I think it's, it's my left, is it your left? I think it is, right? <laughs> um, is fiscal year 20. So that's what we're always comparing against. That's what the, the Y over Y, year over year is always comparing to. So the first draft, uh, was presented uh, at 7.72% increase. Um, then the second draft uh, was still an increase, but was reduced by 1.41%. Uh, and then the third and final draft uh, that is what you'll be voting on is up year over year 2.88%. Um, from draft two to three, it was reduced 3.43%. So let's talk through those drafts so that everybody can understand basically how the process works and also uh, what was in the first draft versus what's in the third draft that you're voting on. So in the first draft, um, there are three items at the top that we call, that are, they're somewhat uncontrollable. So um, the salary increases are part of a larger negotiation process. The healthcare increases are 
the premium increases are not in our control. And last year they came in at about 12.9% um, increase. Uh, the special education increases are also somewhat out of the board's control uh, because they're, they're mandated, um, the services are mandated based on the individual education plan. So each educational leader submitted a budget proposal uh, explaining their request and how the request fit into the district's values and the SU's continuous improvement plan. The first draft included everything, included all of the requested increase and they were reviewed by the budget committee. Um, so, you know, these are the things that the, your educational leaders asked for, um, and, and then the full board took a look at them um, and asked the administration and the budget committee to go back to the drawing board and reduce the budget by 2%. So, as we saw in the previous slide, the first draft represented 7.72% increase over the current budget, over the fiscal year 20 budget. So a reduction of 2%. So then in the second draft, we, I was able to make a little bit of um, a uh, decrease in healthcare premiums uh, because by this point, um, the arbitrator had uh, come out with what the uh, statewide health care plan was going to look like. So. Um, very little uh, savings, I have $5,000 or something like that. Um, and then there were some different changes. So that's why that's highlighted in blue. And then some of the other items that were asked for were reduced um, or uh, totally uh, removed. And also $50,000 capital for a bathroom project for Leland and Gray was also uh, reduced. Um, along with this second budget, uh, there was a first look at revenues and a potential tax rate to, for each town. So we'll talk more about the tax rate piece of it, but I just want to talk a little bit about the revenues. So there was a projected reduction in revenues of $152,000. So while the voters uh, go and vote on expenses, revenues play a big part in how a tax rate can fluctuate. Um, so the revenues that were, the reduction in revenues uh, came from less tuition, uh, less, uh, the small schools grant was not as large as we thought it would be, and then Medicaid funds were also reduced. Um, so between the combination of increased in expenses and reduction in revenues, it drove the tax rate uh, above the tolerable level, uh, particularly in the town of Jamaica. So the full board um, then asked the administration to reduce the current expenses by $500,000 while not affecting programming. That was the um, charge. Um, so we come to the final draft three, um, which basically reduced um, further down some of the uh, requests, um, keeping only the ones that were either uh, needed to be in there for education quality standards um, and, or had minimal impact. And then the other major reductions were uh, they, we cut all of the supply lines across the whole budget by 25%. That gave another $42,000 there. And then remo removing the um, balance of the capital improvement money, 145,000 there. So draft three um, leaves you know, the budget with um, basically maintenance only, meaning cleaning maintenance only, no capital improvements, no building improvements um, left in this budget. So that's where we came up with the $12 million and um, you want to go to the next slide we'll talk about <clears throat> excuse me talk about how this is broken down by major functions so the 12 million dollars um, out of that over 50 percent 55 percent is for direct instructions okay direct instruction 
um, then 3% for debt services, 1% uh, for the food service, 3% for transportation, and 7% for the building operations, which you know includes all the buildings um, and the maintenance. Uh, that was left in there. Um, technology at 4%, uh, administration and front office at 9%, <clears throat> the board cost and the SU assessment uh, at 6%, the student support services, which is your nurse guidance, um, those types of services at 8%, and then co-curricular and work-based learning at 4%. So that, that gives you a, a picture of how everything is broken down or how the costs are broken down. All right, before we move into the tax rate and cost per student, does anybody have any questions so far as to the process? Lori, it's like you read my mind. I was just going to say before we go on, I haven't seen any hands, but I was going to check. OK. I should know better. It's a good stopping point for me to take a breath and answer any questions. Okay, seeing none, right? I don't. You don't see any either, Joe. No, there's there's no little blue hands. Okay. <laughs> All right. So now we're going to talk about how it works through. Um, as you've seen this. Most of you have seen me uh, present this, uh, you know, a few different times. But for those that are new to the call, I uh, would gladly walk through it. Let's go back one slide. There we go. So we have the total expenses there um, at the top. Um, that was what the board approved and is putting before the voters. Um, and then to get to our taxed amount, our ed spending, we have to subtract any offsetting revenues. Now offsetting revenues are any revenue that, that is not made up by taxes. So it would be um, tuition, small schools grants, any type of grants, there's a transportation grant, um, all of those Medicaid funds, all of those um, are called offsetting revenues. And that's where we saw the reduction of $152,000 in that number. So subtracting that, we get to our ed spending. Um, and this is divided by the uh, equalized pupils um, that comes out uh, after a count is done. And it's equalized pupils is a, goes through a, a variety of um, formulas and we come out with 5, 12, 90. So remember we had, I was saying we had four, 546, I think it was, students. Um, and so that equates to 5, 12, 90 in equalized pupils. So that 10 million is divided by the 5, 12 and you have a cost per student of 20,970. I think on the website too, for anybody that is new to this, um, on West River's website, there is a, a great document. It's called Frequently Used Terms Around Budgeting and Tax Rates. And I would just um, encourage you to go and read through that. It answers a lot of what these are and where they come from. Um, okay, so we, we take our cost per student and we uh, look at it against the threshold that is set by the state uh, as a cost containment measure. Um, this changes yearly and on December 1st, uh, the commissioner sets this rate. So this year it was 18,756. So the amount uh, that was over the threshold uh, or known as the penalty um, is $2,200 there. And then there are some exclusions um, that also reduce this penalty. So exclusions can be things like um, any type of uh, debt that you have, the payment and interest can be uh, divided by how many students, how many equalized pupils, and that gives you a certain number. There's also, uh, there's probably about 10 or 15 different exclusions. Um, and some of these exclusions uh, don't actually work themselves out until I submit everything to the state. So that's why your tax rate can be a little bit different um, than you know what we estimate here because those exclusions come into play. All right, so um, 
So the penalty now is uh, 1487 and you add that to the cost per student at the top and you have the um, new cost per student with the penalty of 22457. All right, moving on to the next one. All right, so this is um, divided now by the yield. So I did revise this yield from the first presentation. Uh, it, it went up a little bit, which is good news for West River. It dropped the uh, unified tax rate by two cents. Um, so that is good news, uh, especially in light of the fact of where <clears throat> the deficit for the Ed Fund is is projected to be. Um, they came out and set the yield so that, you know, there were rumors of tax rates going up 22 cents. And, and so they wanted to come out and set this yield um, to kind of relieve people, I think. Um, so that brought the unified tax rate to $2.04. And then of course you are in, um, as you were merged, district, a voluntary merged district, there are incentives involved. And you have the incentive of six cents this year, uh, was eight last year, uh, six this year will be four and two, and then it will go away. So the unified tax rate uh, is $1.98. All right, so how does that work through? Uh, before we figure out how that works through for each town, let's talk about this 5% plus or minus incentive. <laughs> this is um, this is really, it's, a, it's because you merged voluntarily that you get this incentive. Um, it, it's like the two cent incentive that it will go away. Um, I, I know it's okay for fiscal year 21. I cannot promise anything past that um, from what I hear. Um, but in a nutshell, it means that a town's tax rate is not allowed to increase or decrease as compared to the previous year's equalized tax rate. And once this rate surpasses, the town gets the unified tax rate forever. So this is what happened with Jamaica. So um, Jamaica is the only, if you want to go to the next slide, um, Joe, this kind of shows the breakdown of what happens with that 5%. <clears throat> so Jamaica in fiscal year 20 for the fiscal year 20 budgeting cycle lost the, um, the incentive. And so they don't ever get it back again. They have, they are now at the unified tax rate, which is the dollar 98. So the Brookline, Newfane and Townsend all still qualify for it. <clears throat> but again, we're not sure for how long. All right. So who does this tax rate affect? Um, it affects every person, as we know, and it affects in a couple of different ways uh, based on property tax, uh, based on your homestead property. Um, it also affects everyone in this town, and I don't want to forget that it also infect, uh, affects Wyndham as well. Um, so it's not just the the uh, union towns, well, it is all the union towns here, but it's not just the, um, the school buildings, but it also affects Wyndham. So let's uh, move on to the next slide. And so I just, I did this um, last time and I won't, I won't spend a ton of time on this because I think that um, there's a lot of information on here, but I think it's also important for each town to see over time, what has happened here, but also over time, what has happened to the CLA. And it also shows the effect that the CLA can have on your tax rate. So we are, we are far from where we were a few minutes ago talking about the $12 million of expenses now, right? We're down into the tax rate and, and how the CLA can also play into this. Um, so in the case of Brookline, um, you know, they have the 5% incentive, so uh, they were, they're reaping that incentive, but they also, you can see what happened to their CLA here. So their CLA increased, you know, five and a half percent, which is quite a big jump in a year's time. So that actually created a, a situation where increased ex expenses of 
almost 3%, um, actually is a decrease in taxes for them. So you can see how that plays through. Um, the next one is Jamaica. And Jamaica's CLA went down. So, so their tax rate, they didn't have the incentive. So their tax rate was um, a little bit higher. Oh, you have the wrong. Um, so I did put a little note on here that actually uh, Jamaica's um, updated tax rate because the yield change is $1.99. Okay, so if everybody just crosses out that $2.01 and puts $1.99, so, and we'll get the, the, uh, the new one up on the website. Um, so you can see where also um, Jamaica was reappraised and, you know, way back on in fiscal year 18, you can see what's happened through the years here. And so this has also increased their tax rate overall as well. New thing is the next one. Um, and Newfane uh, also had a decrease uh, in their CLA, which of course, you know, affected their tax rate as well. And then the final one, uh, Townsend, which uh, another thing to note I did take off is Townsend, was, I have a note here that says Townsend was reappraised, that's wrong, they were not reappraised, but their CLA did drop in fiscal year 19 to fiscal year 20 from 108 to 99. So that was a big hit for them. And it's it could have been a, a um, from what I understand, it could be one property, two properties that sell differently than uh, expected. And so that's what is happening there. So that's, you know, as we run through each town and where, you know, what happens with the CLA and how does it play into the um, tax rate? So to, to simplify it, um, if you start over on the left, that's the fiscal year 20 tax rate, and then the fiscal year 21 estimated tax rate, and what the year-over-year -year difference is by, uh, by pennies and then by um, percentage. And then also, if you keep working your way right, it's the CLA over. And you can see Brookline's um, CLA percentage went up 5.48 and everybody else's went down. So, all right. So how do people pay their taxes? So if you own property in Vermont, um, you pay taxes one or two ways. If you earn less than 136.5, you are eligible for state payments or property tax adjustment, which is a credit on your ta property tax bill. If you have, if everybody in your household earns over 136.5, then you don't qualify and you pay based on your property value. All right, let's do a little uh, look at some different households here. So the Smith household earns $75,000 and they reside in Townsend and the homestead they live in is worth $200,000. In fiscal year 20, they would have gotten a property tax credit of 1,466 um, that would have reduced their tax bill. And that was based on the income sensitivity percentage of 3.03. .03. So what happens is, is that when your tax rate your, goes up, your income sensitivity percentage also goes up. So in fiscal year 21, they will receive a property tax credit of 1,398. So you can see they're gonna be paying more on their taxes um, over year over year because their credit is less based on their the income going up. It's very complicated, um, but there is a great tool that I would guide everybody to on the um, treasurer's uh, website now that actually helps you to figure out uh, which way you would pay and also walks you through this a little bit easier. Um, so I would encourage everybody to go look at that. Um, the Jones household earns 150,000 and they reside in Jamaica and they live in a house worth 200,000. 
So in fiscal year 20, they would have paid 3,760. And in 21, they'll pay 4,022. So that's an increase of $262 um, year over year. All right. What's the next step on June 10th? Vote, please vote. Um, tell everybody to please come out and vote uh, responsibly, socially <laughs> distancing responsibly. Um, <clears throat> I just wanna do an important reminder here that, um, and this is in your annual report as well. Um, can we go back once? Just, I wanna just talk about article 17 real quick. Um, it's, you know, there's a page in your annual report that speaks to this, but this is one pre-K through 12 budget that Article 17 of the uh, WRED agreement uh, states that uh, because Wyndham did not become part of the, um, the district, that the articles, there has to be two articles. And um, I just wanna point out that if you vote yes on one um, that, that is pre-K through six um, and then no on seven through 12, um, that is not going to help anything because it's one pre-K through 12 budget. The, the committee, the um, board is gonna come back and look at all the expenses pre-K through 12. So I just wanted to make sure everybody understood that um, having two articles on the ballot is confusing um, but to remember that it is one pre-K through 12 budget. All right, and then we can go on to the next slide. And I'm not sure if maybe Al or uh, Joe, you guys wanna jump in here. <clears throat> the board's been doing some great work uh, with future planning and looking ahead. And you know, the reason that the board, well, one of the reasons that the board really um, is they've been talking about doing this since uh, day one, but also those incentives are going to go away. And, you know, it's really important for this work to be done now before they go away. Um, so you guys want to speak to that? Happy to. Um, I, I... I'm not sure if we want to talk about the future planning stuff before or after any questions about what your your part of the presentation. If anybody sure. has any questions specific to Lori's part of the presentation, um, because I'm happy to talk about the future planning, and I know Al, as chair of the budget committee, you'd be happy to talk about it too. Or, um, but that's really getting into the work that we're going to be doing um, over the rest of this summer and into the coming years. Um, and does ha and has no effect on this budget. It, it's it's purely talking about future budgets. Uh, I see a hand, Laura Lezzi. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yep, I'm Laura Ayezi. Um, I'm sorry, I couldn't figure out how to raise my hand earlier. So I'm gonna ask you a question that's pretty late. Um, back, I believe it was like slide 12 when you guys were um, making cuts from the budget. Do I recall that you said you cut out cleaning in the maintenance costs? No, that's what's left. <laughs> so, um, no, that what the removal of the capital improvement money is any major projects that come along um, that need to be done. Okay, uh, thank you. Know, you. Deferred I, I, there, there are there are some deferred maintenance costs that um will be deferred longer now uh cutting this money but um no no the cleaning and uh all of that is absolutely in the budget thank you i misunderstood and that's so important today no good good that's a great clarifying question thank you thank you uh, i see another hand patty hi i'm patty dixon from jamaica I have a question about student counts and how they impact everything. Um, I see in the presentation that Jamaica is listed as having 35 students. My understanding from things I've heard that we may be down to 25 students. Um, I assume, and that's 
because of the the choice kids going students going to a different school or moving out um and i'm wondering how that impacts because you're you've made this based on a 35 student count how does this impact us going down are we going to have some surprise down the road um is there some other um thing that we're going to miss out on because we lost students to school choice um as happened before bill's gonna answer <laughs> no, no, because this is one pre-K-12 budget. The student counts were broken up just as a courtesy so that people could understand where the students are. But we budget based on all the students in the district, not, and then, and that has no bearing on, on spending. I mean, we're not breaking spending down by, by building. Um, so how many, how many students in a building doesn't matter. But but we did lose that transition, that 5% transition because of spending. I assume that had something to do with the per pupil spending at Jamaica. Is no, that no, no, the, the number of students in Jamaica does not have, is not a direct uh, correlation to the unified tax rate. The unified tax rate is based on 512 equalized pupils. So it's counting all of the, the pupils. Um, as far as the incentive is concerned, uh, no, it was looking at your past year's fiscal year 19's equalized tax rate, okay, before mm -hmm. any changes were made. Um, and that's where the, uh, it was comparing fiscal year 19 equalized tax rate to the fiscal year 20 um, okay. unified tax rate. And that's where the adjustment came in, but it wasn't based on student movement. Okay, so that's how we lost the 5%. It's you lost the 5% by comparing, comparing the fiscal year 19 tax rate to the fiscal year 20 uh, estimated unified tax rate. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There was a question on chat as to whether we would ha still have the meeting to vote on the articles um, on June 9th, and that is true. Uh, the meeting on June 9th will be a Zoom meeting. We'll publish a link and everyone can come in and ask questions. Um, the, we can only, I mean, right now we can have a gathering of 25 and, and this is just a much simpler, safer way to handle a, a larger crowd like that. So we're not having, we're not to in-person meetings yet. Those, those are chat questions from a person without a microphone on a computer. Go ahead, Dana. Lori. Um, mm -hmm. Just to help Jamaica citizens uh, clarify this, from here on out, any future tax rate, Jamaica will be taxed at the unified tax rate from here on out, right? That is correct, with a, the, which includes the in first incentive of the, the 2468, but that is correct. So you are actually paying um, a more uh, correct so to speak, tax rate um, than all the other towns. So at some point, all the other towns will catch up with us and we'll all be together with the tax, unified tax rate. That is, that is correct. I did pose the question to um, Brad James, who I've, uh, the education uh, finance manager um, at the AOE about these incentives and how they uh, work with the current situation that we're in, um, you know, the, the fiscal shortfall in the education fund. Um, and he, I have not gotten a uh, email back from him yet, but um, I did ask the question specifically because um, I have been told that the 5% incentive may not last as long as the, uh, the 8642 
uh, merger incentives. But you are correct, at some point there is going to be um, a reconciliation, so to speak, of tax rates. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, Keegan, you have a question. Thank you. Lori, thank you so much for sharing this presentation and going through all of the different components um, so clearly with all of us. I appreciate that. The last piece um, that I was kind of, I was taking notes at the same time I was listening, which means I, I missed something. Um, and that has to do with um, the budget that's going to be proposed to all of the voters mm -hmm. in our respective towns for a pre-K through 12 budget with two articles. And you had said something about you can vote yes or no to either article, but can you clarify a little bit more about like what you were saying, like if you vote yes for article 17 and I believe it was either 12 or 14, can you, can you just restate what you had already said about? Yeah, I would love to clarify that based on your question. Thank so you. um, in last year we had, uh, you know, we had the two mm -hmm. articles and people, it was very confusing because they thought, well, if I support the elementary, I'm going to vote yes. And if I don't support the secondary, I'm going to vote no. And that really doesn't do anything to help um, because it is a pre-K through 12 budget that is artificially split to satisfy the article 17. So what I'm trying to get across to people is, is that if you're going to vote yes, vote yes on both pieces. And if you're going to vote no, vote no on both pieces. I see. Thank you so much for the clarification. No, thank you for bringing that up. Al, you were the next hand I saw. Lori, great presentation. Uh, thank absolutely you. Absolutely amazing. Um, just a couple things I wanted to touch on just to help maybe people to clarify and understand um, kind of how we got into this uh, being over the threshold. Uh, can you just speak to how the threshold has increased as in terms of percentage over the years, as well as the yield, and then kind of offset that with uh, costs that we've had on the other side, special education and healthcare uh, and how we've just gradually, you know, had this increase and in, have been in the, the penalty box, basically. Right. So um, Al's right that the um, that the yield and the uh, threshold has not increased uh, to the extent of some of the costs that we don't have a lot of control over, like healthcare um, at. Uh, I think the the last analysis I did. The average over the last um, five years was 11% increase in healthcare. Over the last three, I think it's probably more uh, about probably 12.5% um, increase. And certainly the yield has not increased by that uh, number, that percentage. I don't have the um, I have that somewhere, but I don't have that in front of me right now, but I, I can guarantee you it has not increased 12% in the last um, three to five years, uh, that yield number, nor has the threshold number um, increased that much. It the threshold number typically goes up, um, I don't know, a few hundred dollars a year. So you can see it's not, uh, you know, it doesn't help anything. Um, you know, the next slide sort of shows, um, if you wanna just go to that, I can sort of speak to, you know, the, the penalty and the threshold, I mean, the penalty, you know, is also a result of the declining enrollment. So, you know, as your costs remain the same or go up, like we just talked about with healthcare um, and, you know, salary increases and that type of thing has gone up over the years. Um, but the student count has gone down. So that also has pushed the budget up over into the penalty box. Great, sorry, that, Joe, that was question one. Uh, mm -hmm. And then on the, the offsetting revenue, I know you, you spoke to that number, I think it was 150,000 decrease. Can you, can you talk about why that number went down? 
Sure. Um, there were a couple of different things that happened uh, from fiscal year 20. You know, it's a comparison to fiscal year 20. Um, one of the things that happened was the small schools grant. Um, basically, I, I was informed it would be one number and it ended up to be um, a little bit less, about $40,000, $50,000 less. Um, and it had to do with uh, New, Newbrook and when they actually got the small schools grant. So it was not in the year that it needed to be to count towards the ongoing transition small schools grant. Big mouthful for saying that the number was wrong that they gave me based on the year that Newfane or Newbrook uh, qualified for a small schools grant. Then the other, um, one of the other major places that we're seeing a reduction is in tuitions. So less students coming from sending towns. That's probably the biggest portion of the 152. And then <clears throat> Medicaid funding um, is also another place where uh, year over year, the, that fluctuates um, so much, but we had uh, two or three major students um, move out and it, it caused that fluctuation, which it's tied to special ed, so it makes sense because it um, is volatile like special ed. So those were the three areas that they were, revenues were reduced. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then um, <clears throat> just picking up on what Dana was mentioning about the unified tax trade, I, I think it's important people, for people to know that even once we get to that unified tax rate, that the, our actual tax rate is going to be based on the CLA of the individual town. Um, mm -hmm. So that's yes. just kind of important to keep in mind. We'll never have exactly the same tax rate. That's exactly right. You will have the same unified tax rate, but then once it works its way through the CLA, it, it um, is town specific. Mm -hmm. And then Joe, final one, uh, income sensitivity. Can you just talk to, in your example, you talked about going from 3.03 .03 to 3.35. Mm -hmm. Can you explain how that happened? And sure. And that you know, that is all part of the, the calculation of the um, tax rate. And it um, basically, when the tax rate goes up, also it follows suit with the um, percentage of income that can be, uh, that is looked at to, um, to look at the income sensitivity piece of it. So it was 3.03 .03 in fiscal year 20. And I think it is, I think it was 3.35 in fiscal year 21. So looking at more of the, the person's income, the household's income that can be used to create that tax, um, property tax credit. It's, it's really pretty complicated, the income sensitivity. <laughs> I have a slew of paperwork on it that I can put on the website, but I really would rather people go to the treasurer's website. And um, there, like I said, there is a tool now that is very helpful. What the tool won't do for you, um, the tool does not take into account merger incentives. So Jamaica, for instance, uh, anybody from Jamaica could probably get a pretty good idea of the income sensitivity piece of what they would be paying versus uh, if they were paying just on Homestead um, because they're at the unified tax rate. Great, thanks Lori. Mm -hmm. It's safe to say if the, the percentage goes up, you're probably paying a higher uh, tax bill. Yes, okay. because your, your property tax credit goes down. <laughs> It's a little bit counterintuitive, but that's that's what happens. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't see any more hands. Any more questions with regard to this year's budget that we're voting in a week? Well, a little more than a week. Okay, so the future planning piece, um, we have talked 
almost since the board was formed that you know this this sort of this sort of thing was coming where you know the, we we all knew the enrollment was declining we've all seen that chart that Lori put up uh, just that we put up just a second ago um, you know and costs have increased and pupils have decreased and and based on the funding formula we sort of all knew that this moment was coming and as part of the merger um, you know in 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 addition to increased opportunity and, and better equity for the students in our district, you know, there was the hope that there could be some savings or at least cost containment. Um, so we've been talking about doing this future planning and what do we look like. And now that we've been operational as a district for two years, um, we've laid out a schedule, <clears throat> excuse me, of meetings that go through this entire summer. We've already met once as a board. Our next future planning meeting is um, next Monday. And we're gonna continue the conversations looking at options about what we can do as a district um, in terms of, you know, what, what schools do we run? How many schools do we run? At the first meeting, we had eight different options um, from, you know, do exactly what we're doing now and don't change anything to, you know, choice out to become a ascending town for almost all of our students. Um, keep the keep the youngest ones at home. And, you know, high level looks at what would that do to the tax rate? What's the implication? What are the pros and cons for students? And we sorted through that, asked some questions, came up with a couple of other scenarios, kicked it back to the administration and, and the budget committee to work through. And I know the budget committee met and explored some other options. Um, and talk through a little more depth on some of the ones that we had looked at. And now next Monday, the whole board will meet again and we'll continue that conversation. And we're gonna keep going through that through August. And hopefully by August, we'll have an option that seems to make sense for our students and our, and our district, you know, that gives, gives our students the educations, education that we want to give them and doesn't break everybody. Um, you know, but it, it's a long process and, you know, the really important thing is we're holding these meetings and this is really meant to be a conversation. As we look at these options, we value input from the community, um, all the stakeholders in this. We want to know, um, what do you want? I mean, we can design things and we'll, and then we'll go back and work through it. And then we come back and we're very transparent about if this is what you want, this is what it's going to cost or this is what's gonna happen and this is how it's gonna look. So that's the process that we're going through. Um, there are no decisions being made yet. Um, you know, it's just a conversation and it continues, <clears throat> it continues for the next couple of months. So, you know, please join in. Al, you wanna talk about it as chair of the budget committee? Yeah, I would say, uh great point about the community and and of course we want to implement what the community wants and certainly coming out of the last meeting that we had we had a pretty convincing uh six to one vote straw poll vote i mean that um we would get rid of some of those choices and all of those choices involved uh not having leland and gray so you know we wanted to instill in the community the, the fact that we've we know that you value Leland and Gray. Uh, we will continue to have Leland and Gray. It may not be in exactly the same location. Uh, we may move it. We may uh, knock it down and rebuild. But uh, we've heard everybody loud and clear, and that uh, will need to continue and be part of the plans that we have going forward. Thanks. Thanks, Al. Okay, so that about sums up future planning. I mean, if you have a question, I can try and answer it. Um, there are no specifics to give you yet other than the conversation continues and when the meetings are. Um, and, you know, please join us. Um, but, uh, you know, if there was a general question, I'd certainly be happy to try and give it an answer. But I don't see anything. Um, any more budget? 
<clears throat> excuse me, budget questions? What was the last slide, Lori? Oh, questions. Your We're kids. <laughs> the kids. The kids that you support. Doing this. <laughs> Okay, does anyone have does anyone have anything they'd like to add, comment, make a, make a question, ask a question? Because <clears throat> that's all we have for you tonight. Oh, Dana, I see your hand. If nobody has anything else, I make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Is there a second to that motion? Second. Thank you, Mike. All right. All in favor, please say aye. And I, we have to do the roll call vote because. So, Dana. Dana. Aye. Mike. Aye. Al. Aye. Egan. Aye. Howie. Aye. All right. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And don't forget to go out and vote on June 10th.